Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, uh, this session is called the Force of Nature. I will start talking about uh, uh, some scientific research, and other speakers following me will address how the uh, research is applied to society, how we try to uh, mitigate the risk from these uh, uh, hazards. Okay, so my topic today is uh, uh, how we observe and try to understand the cycle of great subduction zone earthquakes. Let's start with uh, 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 some background and how the Earth works. As you all know, the Earth has a solid inner core and liquid outer core and a solid mantle. The most outside layer, about 30 kilometers to 100 kilometers thick, and it's a thin shell, brittle thin shell, what we call the lithosphere. And the lithosphere is broken into a, a number of uh, large pieces. And we call these large pieces tectonic plates. The Earth's interior is very hot. It's so hot that the mantle needs to convect. And mantle convection, just like uh, water in your pot, right? Uh, mantle convection will cause the place <clears throat> to move around. And different plates. Uh, the plates will have boundaries. One of the boundaries is called a subduction zone, where one plate goes beneath the other. There are also other types of boundaries. In some cases, the, uh, the two plates will move horizontally like that. In some ca cases, hot material comes up and to form new material, and the plates will move apart like that. But our concern is the subduction zone. At a subduction zone, we see volcanoes. And volcanoes, as you can see from your, uh, 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 your, your home, right? And also, we have uh, earthquakes. There are different types of earthquakes. There are earthquakes in the uh, upper plate. There are earthquakes in the downgoing plate. The flashing uh, blue spots you see here are, represent the earthquakes. But the wor worst type of earthquake is uh, the earthquakes that occur on the interface of uh, the place. So the bad news is, subduction zone is the place where you and I live. The distribution of earthquakes, these colorful dots, mark the plate boundaries. Around the Pacific, it's mostly subduction zones. And you and I live on some of the subduction zones. And by living, living on the subduction zone, we are concerned about earthquakes. And for large earthquakes, probably the most recent me memory, the worst case, one of the worst cases, is the earthquakes that occurred in Japan in 2011, magnitude 9, the, the approximate rupture area of that earthquake. And that earthquake produced a, a devastating tsunami, and that killed about 20,000 people, as you all remember. You also remember the earthquake earlier in Sumatra, even worse, that was a magnitude 9.2, and it caused uh, the, the, the devastating tsunami caused about uh, uh, a quarter of a million deaths around the Indian Ocean. I am concerned about uh, subduction earthquakes in my backyard because we know for a fact we've had these kind of earthquakes in the past too. The last one occurred. In 1700, the tsunami it generated actually caused a lot of damage in Japan on the other side of the Pacific. And what about uh, uh, Chile? And in Chile, you have many, many earthquakes of this type. You also have the largest earthquake ever recorded on Earth. That was 1960, magnitude point uh, nine and a half. And all of you should also remember the violet shaking in 2010. And so all these earthquakes and caused damage and tsunamis. Now we want to see why and how subduction zones, subduction faults, produce earthquakes. It produces earthquakes because subduction is not uh, going on in a smooth fashion. The fault is actually stuck for some time, typically for 100 years, because of friction. When the fault is stuck, like in the, at the, in the top diagram, stuck, and plate convergence is still going on, and the plate is like a spring 
being compressed, the upper plate, like a spring, like beneath your feet, beneath our feet, is like a spring being compressed, accumulating elastic string energy. And that energy will be used for the next earthquake. And at this time, what we see on the surface of the ground, if you have good observations, we'll see the land beneath our feet slowly moving landward towards the, your volcanoes. And after a few hundred, typically a few hundred years, the fault can no longer hold. It will uh, slip to produce a, earth, a big earthquake. When that happens, the energy is suddenly released, and cause, it causes ground shaking. You all felt. And the seafloor will be uplifted to cause tsunami. And the consequence can be quite devastating. At this moment, if you have good observations on, on the ground, what you will see is the, uh, the, the ground suddenly moves seaward in the opposite direction as uh, before the earthquake. There are many different ways to study earthquakes. And some of my colleagues study seismic waves. Some of my colleagues study tsunamis. Some of my colleagues study the geology of earthquakes. But today, I will talk about only one uh, a type of study. That is how we observe this kind of uh, back and forth motion of the of Earth's surface. We have come a long way in this uh, 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 work. And the, uh, the development of technology and science has advanced uh, tremendously. Back in the 70s, just after the plate tectonics theory has become recognized, and we had the concept of subduction earthquakes. We, can, we could anticipate the ground would move back and forth like that. But we didn't have observations. It was just a concept. In the 80s, and we had the, uh, fairly preliminary observations, land-based. What's shown here is called leveling, but we have other types of land-based observations. And we had better understanding. But since the 1990s, we had We've had a space geodesy. One example is GPS, the satellite system that you all use in your cars. When you drive around, you know your location. That's GPS. And, but the GPS can be used in a better way, well, not better, in a more precise way with a lot of data proce uh, processing. We can uh, 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 de determine the position of any point on Earth very precisely and to the accuracy of a, within a millimeter very precise. With that kind of measurements, we can observe how the Earth deforms in earthquake cycles. Back to our uh, uh, examples of large earthquakes. Let's first look at Cascadia. As I said, we at Cascadia, we had an earthquake about 300 years ago, over 300 years ago. And over the past 20 years, we've been using GPS, sat, uh, a satellite system, to observe our, the motion of the, the land. Uh, what's shown here are some of our stations, the antennas. What we are seeing now is uh, the land area move, moves landward, away from the ocean. This vector, these arrows, show, uh, show velocities. So if you, when you see these arrows, you, you know the land is moving at uh, maybe at one or two centimeters per year towards land. And uh, the velocity, the speed, decreases as you move further landward. And that means the, uh, the subduction fault is locked, and our crust is accumulating energy. That's we, why we, say, we see it's moving landward. So that's Cascadia. However, not all subduction zones are the same. With the same satellite system, we observe different behavior in different places. Cascadia is moving landward, but Chile is actually coastal stations are moving landward. But some, most of, a lot of land, landward stations are actually moving seaward, so we have the opposing motion. If you go to a, a Sumatra or Japan today, you'll see all the stations are moving seaward. So it's, uh, it was quite puzzling for some time, but it became less puzzling once we recognized noticed that actually these observations were made at different times after 
a great earthquake. It turned out the observations we made in one particular subduction zone is a snapshot of a continuous deformation process. So we observe deformation at different stages of the earthquake cycle in different places. So as if by studying these different places, we are looking at different time evolution, and we put put them together, we can piece together a complete earthquake cycle. To do that, we need to understand what's responsible for this kind of behavior. And what I can tell you is now we can fully uh, we uh, uh, we understand quite well, and what's responsible is the、uh, the behavior. Of the of the mantle, the deeper part of Earth, a behavior what we call viscoelastic behavior. So, what is viscoelasticity? As we all know, the mantle is elastic. It transmits seismic waves. Seismic waves is the is vibration of elastic body. So, the mantle is elastic. But we also know the mantle is viscous. One example is post glacial rebound. We have a glacier, an ice sheet. That will depress the surface of the Earth. When the ice melts, the Earth does not bounce back immediately. It, it bounces back very slowly. So the delayed response, not immediate, the delayed slow response, is indication that mantle must be viscous. Okay, so the mantle is both elastic and viscous. Now we are talking about the material. It's called viscoelastic material. So how it behaves behaves depends on the on how fast you load the material. The mantle viscosity, what,、uh, how viscous mantle is measured by parameter called viscosity. If you are not comfortable with that number, you can you can compare that with the viscosity of honey at room temperature. The viscosity of honey at room temperature is about one thousand of that unit. As you can see, the mantle viscosity is many orders of magnitude higher. So, if you take a piece of rock from the mantle, it's still solid rock, right? But given enough time, it has a viscous, viscous behavior, very slow. We need to understand the、uh, earthquake cycle using a viscoelastic earth, a viscoelastic mantle. So, what is viscoelasticity? You still, if you still feel uncomfortable about、uh, viscoelasticity. Let me uh, uh, do a demonstration, and this is、uh, a very popular toy for children in Canada and U.S., but not popular、uh, in South America. It's called silly putty, and you see, and this thing it looks like a play-doh, right? But it see it bounces, right? It's elastic, right? It's certainly elastic. Yeah, it can bounce back, but you, you see this. If I if I do it slowly, it's viscous, right? So this is viscoelasticity.、And、of course, the mantle viscoelasticity is a bit more complicated than this, but still, in principle, it's similar behavior. And the mantle is a lot harder than this. You cannot stretch stretch a mantle like that. And with that kind of uh, uh, Material properties, and with our three-dimensional structure, with a lot of equations, with a lot of computing power, we can come up with a computer model like that. And、uh, I will not go through the details of models, but I will simply uh, 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 claim that we can reproduce the、uh, observations. So we can observe the observations quite nicely. If you compare the blue vectors, that's the model predicted. Velocities and the red vectors, that's the GPS observed velocities, and they they are quite consistent. And and as a scientific model, the model is actually quite simple. It's not very complicated, not a complex structure. So uh, uh, because the, it captures the、uh, uh, the fundamental physics, it can explain the seemingly very complex observations quite nicely. In summary, and from observations and Uh, modeling, simulation. Now we understand a large after large earthquake, and the、uh, we we see a wholesale landward、uh, seaward motion, 
and followed by opposing motion, seaward motion like in Sumatra, Japan today, and opposing motion like in southern Chile and uh, Alaska. Alaska had an earthquake in 1964. And we saw the same see the same behavior. And for Cal uh, Cascadia and many other subduction zones, quite late in the earthquake cycle, we see everything moving landward. So we have this uh, change of behavior. But so far here, we do not see what happens offshore, beneath the ocean. All our observations are from land. You see the coastline. But the fault almost is entirely offshore, off the coast. But it was, it's very difficult to have observations. So we didn't know what was happening. We could speculate. We could ask the question whether the opposing motion actually started earlier, right after the earthquake, offshore beneath the ocean. We didn't know that. But now we know. Now we do. And because now we have uh, seafloor geodesy. And back to our examples, the best example of the application of seafloor geodesy to this kind of research is Japan. That earthquake caused a lot of casualty damage. It's, it is saddening, but it also produced uh, spectacular observations for our, to study these earthquakes. You see these vectors on land. And these are GPS stations, land stations. You see those vectors, those thicker uh, arrows, they are beneath the ocean. They are seafloor GPS stations. The Japanese colleagues, they, were, they had the, uh, the vision uh, early enough to put some GPS stations on the seafloor. So they were able to observe how the seafloor moved. You see the largest vector there on the seafloor, it moved uh, 31 meters in the earthquake, something we had never seen before, never anticipated before. However, this is not a whole story. And what's more important is how these stations behaved after the earthquake. To, to your right, that's the observations. A year after, you see some of the seafloor stations actually move backward. So we do see opposing motion right after the earthquake. So the theory is quite complete. Of course, we have modeled this. So we develop computer models, simulate this, no problem. Yeah, the, all, the whole thing can be simulated, but I'm, I, I don't need to show the results to convince you. So I, I like to uh, end my talk with, uh, to, by pointing out the importance of uh, seafloor geodesy. So that's the new frontier. And it's, uh, it has become, the, the technology has become quite mature. And in this case, if you, do, you want to do GPS, you have uh, uh, transponders on the sea floor that communicate with uh, a sea surface, sea, sea surface platform, either ship or, or other platforms using uh, a sound wave, right, acoustically. And that GPS antenna will communicate with the uh, satellites elect electromagnetically. And in the end, and you can actually determine the average location of your seafloor little network very precisely. Of course, it's very, it's very costly. But now the technology has further developed. We can do it in a cheaper way. And Japan is leading uh, this kind of uh, research. And other subduction zones are trying to follow up. Like for Cascadia, there is a plan. We have a few stations, but there is a plan like that to install more stations. We also have continuous monitoring with the uh, seafloor cables, fiber optic cables. And I'm sure with, uh, with the decrease of the cost and recognition of the importance to observing the subduction fault at short distance, but even seafloor, many countries will follow up and will make the same effort. And I'm sure it will happen in many subduction zones. It will happen in Chile. So in five or 10 years, we'll have a much better understanding of how the fault, our subduction system, works in the earthquake cycle. And based on that, we'll, we'll come up with a better strategy to deal with these earthquakes and the tsunamis. Thank you.